Hello, it's Randy Rhodes. Here's a clip from our show and go to randyrhodes.com for the whole thing and a podcast. Buy a stinking podcast. All things Randy at randyrhodes.com. Go, go for launch. Speaking truth to power, the Randy Rhodes Show. Do you know for sure everyone who was at that meeting with Donald Trump Jr.? No, I don't represent Donald Trump Jr., and I do not know everyone for sure that was at that meeting. Uh, and the president was not at the meeting. I can tell you he was not there. The president wasn't aware of the meeting and did not attend it. Doesn't it show intent and willingness on the part of Don Jr. and Jared and Paul Manafort to, be, to collude with the Russians? And let me just point out, Natalia Veselnitskaya was not just some Russian off the street. She had close <laughs> ties to uh, people in the Kremlin. Well, number one, if there was the discussion was going to be about if it was going to be about Russian uh, opposition research that a Russian lawyer had is those goes on. You know, that goes on in campaigns all the time. Opposition research is a big part of campaigning. It, does, it just doesn't go the on example. with the Russians all the time, Jay. <laughs> well, no, but look, this was here's what happened. First of all, nothing happened. Isn't it also important whether or not it's legal, whether or not it's wrong, whether or not it's ethical? Well, I'm. Um, you're conflating, so you're conflating, Jake, three perspectives here. The legality, was the meeting and what took place legal or, or not? We, of course, and as almost every legal expert says, it's not illegal. And then you're trying to put a, a, a moral, ethical aspect to it. And it's easy to do that in 2020 hindsight, but not when you're in the middle of a campaign. All right, there's Jay Seculo, everybody, a guy who runs a charity that pays his family very heavily. Uh, but uh, OK, we can talk about him another day. Great news for us, though. Last week, uh, last week, while 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 Dim Bulb was in the City of Lights, Crew uh, and the National Security Archive and nice Night First Amendment Institute quietly won their lawsuit to obtain and make public uh, the Mar-a-Lago visitor logs. Now, we hope the White House logs will be next. Richard Painter is an ethics watchdog who did two years, and I say did two years as if it were prison because he knows how I feel about the Bush White House, before becoming a professor of corporate law at the University of Minnesota Law School. And he's also, in his busy schedule, he fits in being the vice chair of CREW. So uh, please welcome to the show Richard Painter. Hello, Professor. Hello. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me on the show. Well, you know, we love you around here. We just think that you are, uh, you know, a, a voice in the wilderness. So you saw, uh, congratulations, by the way, on the work that crew is doing. I hope the White House logs will be next. Well, I hope so, too. Uh, we ought to find out who's going in and out of there, whether they're Russian agents or whoever <laughs> else it is. Yeah, well, you know, Chris Wallace said it's not just some Russian off the street. Now, why is it every time you think of Trump and Russian uh, Russian women, you think of hookers? I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's a crazy thing. But, uh, okay, so they tried to make this meeting in the office uh, about a woman and adoption. And now it turns out there were more Russians in that room than the entire uh, uh, com com company of the Bolshoi Ballet. Well, yes, it sounds like Vladimir Putin has adopted himself a presidential candidate who won. I mean, that's you know, what this is all about. We all know that. Uh, they uh, wanted to get rid of those sanctions the Obama administration imposed on Russia. And so they decided they got stuff on Hillary Clinton through computer hacking and espionage and the rest of it. And then I guess they had gotten their goods on Hillary and they wanted to meet with the Trump people and see what kind of deal they could work out. And yeah. You had the top three people from the Trump team there. This wasn't just some woman off the street. I mean, they got the top three people in the campaign and. Uh, they say that Trump, President Trump himself didn't attend, but um, then they start bringing up the Secret Service. And the only reason the Secret Service had anything to do with it would be if uh, they were thinking of having Trump attempt, because he's the only one who had Secret Service protection at the time. So I don't know what's going on. They've got about five different stories of what was going on, but it's pretty clear it was a pretty big deal when you have uh, the top brass of the campaign meeting with the Russians. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's stunning. It really is. And yes, you're right. Jay Sekulow, uh, again, that brilliant, uh, you know, uh, um, piece of, of lawyering, uh, said, I wonder why the Secret Service, if this was nefarious, why the Secret Service allowed these people in uh, to Junior's Russia meeting. Um, the Secret Service is supposed to protect you 
uh, they are, let's say, the sword, but not the shield. Okay, they they just physically protect. And Donald Trump Jr. was not under Secret Service protection. He was not a protectee at the time. Why do they sit there and make this stuff up that's so easily debunkable? The Secret Service put out a, 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 a you know a letter over the weekend and said that Donald Trump Jr. was not a protectee of the USSS in June 2016. Thus, we would not have screened anyone he was meeting with at that time. So apparently well, that's that's true. That's true. But I am very they ought to clarify that Trump wasn't at this meeting. I know they say that Donald Trump senior wasn't at the meeting, but uh, they brought up the Secret Service. And the only reason the Secret Service would have been involved in that meeting would have been if they were thinking of having Donald Trump senior attend the meeting. So they if that were the case, uh, then they would run the names of the attendees, I would think, by the Secret Service, because he was a candidate under Secret Service protection and you can't have any old Russian coming in and meet with him. I guess they got to be screened by the Secret Service. But uh, that's what troubles me. Why they bring up the Secret Service if uh, Trump had nothing to do with the meeting? Trump saying it is interesting, and you know there are rumors, and I don't really uh, you know uh, uh, traffic in them. But there are rumors, and it could you know come out on Friday afternoon at five o'clock, like everything else does, that Donald Trump was on the phone and that he called in to see how they were doing. Uh, we'll, mm-hmm. well, yeah, we'll just have to wait. But okay, let's go back to that that, that legal, uh, you know, uh, pillar of uh, the community, Jay Sekulow. Um, he says that there are no laws that have been broken. Now, you would know better than I do uh, about the federal election laws and a thing of value and all this. He said most legal experts that he's talked to agree that there was no statute violated. Do you agree with that? Well, uh, first of all, I don't want to blame him. I mean, he's a criminal defense attorney, and uh, I think all of them need good criminal defense attorneys. uh, And I think the president should have a good criminal defense attorney right now. And they always say their client didn't violate the law. That's what they always say. Uh, It's a pretty weak case they didn't violate the law because, uh, first of all, the campaign finance rules uh, prohibit coordination with any outside group, even in a group of Americans. If you coordinate with a group other than the campaign, you can get in trouble under the campaign finance laws because these outside groups aren't supposed to be picking up your work for you. They can advocate and dump on Hillary all they want, but they can't do your opposition research for you or you end up violating the campaign finance laws. And then on top of that, we have an additional prohibition on foreign contribution campaigns. And these are a bunch of Russians. They're not Americans. A bunch of Russians. And they say they dug up the dirt on Hillary. Uh, uh, so that is a, it's a clear problem under campaign finance laws. And then on top of that, you have the fact that the way the Russians get dirt off people is through espionage and computer hacking. So probably they should have figured out that whatever the Russians had was probably illegally obtained. And, and that's a criminal offense to start taking possession of uh, stolen computer files, just like taking possession of child pornography. It's a criminal offense. And why would any sane person have anything to do with his meeting unless they wanted to get arrested? It is. It's so bizarre. I mean, this is like uh, it's not even about espionage here, although the hacking, you know, is, uh, you know, a part of it. But it seems like a RICO statute violation. It seems like a conspiracy. It seems like this is uh, what Mueller is looking into, money laundering, conspiracy to commit. You know, I mean, this does not seem as much about espionage as originally thought, does it? Well, we don't know. We know the Russians have been conducting spying operations in the United States uh, really since the 1917 uh, Russian Revolution. And they've been trying to destabilize Western democracies for the past 100 years, too. And and uh, they never got very far in the United States until they discovered the far right wing of our political spectrum. But, uh, you know, I... I think it's pretty clear they did a lot of computer hacking of DNC and uh, Clinton and the rest of it. And when you agree to meet with the Russians to get dirt on your opponent, you're, you're making a pact with the devil here. They're going to give you stolen uh, uh, documents, uh, put you in jeopardy of uh, a criminal offense, and uh, they're there trying to accomplish the objectives of their own government, uh, which is to destabilize our election. Uh, I don't see how any rational politician who didn't want to end up being criminally charged would have anything to do with a meeting like this. So 
compare this to the Fox News slant that, you know, they're trying to deflect and say Hillary and, and, and had a consultant who was an American girl who was uh, of Ukrainian descent, so am I, uh, and that she had gone to the Ukrainian embassy and she was trying to dig up dirt on Manafort uh, because Manafort was not registered as a foreign lobbyist, but she knew that he had been uh, lobbying for Viktor Yanukovych, the pro-Russian dictator of Ukraine. Is it the same well, no. I mean, I'm not going to defend everything that Hillary Clinton said. Me neither. I, I think oh, no. They got Me neither. They in all sorts of jams. But here we have some operative uh, working for the Clinton campaign and may have been cutting some corners to try and go dig up dirt on somebody. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's very different than the top three people at the Trump campaign agree to meet with a Russian agent after having been told that the Russian government wanted to throw the election in favor of Donald Trump and wanted to deliver... Uh, damaging information on Hillary Clinton. Uh, this is a clear uh, coordination between the very top people in the campaign and the Russian government and its agents. Uh, that's different than some uh, campaign worker who is uh, running off doing something they shouldn't be doing. And I think the Clintons cut a lot of corners and looked the other way. And uh, I definitely got my problems with the Clinton operation. But they really, the, the Clinton people are, are the junior varsity team when it comes to <laughs> the uh, corruption and, uh, uh, and, quite frankly, betrayal of the United States here uh, to a foreign power. This is a very, very serious uh, situation. And, and quite frankly, I'm getting all tired of hearing about Clinton. Every time this president gets in trouble, he's going to be talking about Clinton. And regardless of what you think about President Bush, at least he didn't wear every people got in trouble, start talking about, well, Al Gore, this, that, and the other thing. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, you win the election, your president, do a decent job and quit uh, trying to blame everything on the person you beat in the election. Yeah, I mean, and, and the idea that they floated this story about adoption, I mean, how stupid do they have to be? You know, most people who are paying attention to this story understand the Magnitsky Act, and they understand that uh, the sanctions that were put on Russia uh, after Magnitsky was tortured and killed and beaten in jail and died, uh, he was a forensic accountant for uh, Mr. William Browder, who had a uh, Hermitage uh, investment fund in Russia. Uh, it's a longer story than that, but suffice it to say, uh, Browder lobbied Congress hard for a Magnitsky law. That Those were sanctions on people in Russia that committed human rights abuses. And the retaliation for those laws was Putin banning American adoption. So when they say it was about adoption, it was a woman who came to talk about adoption. Uh, adoption is Putin's issue. Uh, you know, they, could, they they had to have been talking about sanctions. And the adoption ban was maybe something she was offering as a quid pro quo. Take the sanctions off, we'll let the adoptions go through. Because there's nothing we can do to create a, a pathway for Americans to adopt Russians without Putin saying, okay, uh, that's what's going to happen. So why did they even go down that adoption road? It made everybody well, look I- at Magnitsky. Yeah, it was code because the adoption thing is so tied up in the sanctions. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, we know full well what both sides of this deal wanted. The Trump people wanted the dirt on Hillary Clinton. Right. And wanted the Russians to figure out a way to disseminate that without the Trump people getting tagged for it. And that's why I think ultimately the decision was made that the Russians would leak it to WikiLeaks rather than hand it over to the Trump people. Right. I, I think that's what the deal was on that side. And what the Russians wanted was that the sanctions would be uh, lifted. And, of course, as soon as the sanctions are lifted, the adoption ban would be lifted by Putin. But uh, neither side gave a hoot about the adoption. Right. Uh, that's a joke that Donald Trump. Uh, that his team would spend one minute worrying about Russian adoption or that uh, Putin, uh, I don't think, gives a hoot about adoption. No, about no. The and, sanctions and, and it was and the it was, dirt on Hillary. Yes, of course. And it was such a silly thing to say the meeting was about because everybody who uh, is involved in adopting children from Russia, and there are plenty of people who understand this thing and when it stopped and why it stopped, some people were mid adoption. And that, you know, there you say that we were talking about Russian adoption, and everybody who was involved in trying to adopt a Russian orphan, they all know it was the Magnitsky law. So, why, which was sanctioned. So, yeah. 
right? I mean, it's you a had... lawyer game. It's it... a lawyer game. In other words, technically, it's about adoption because adoptions are part of the issue involving the sanctions. Right. And you know, so technically, you could say. It's about adoption. I bet they didn't use the word adoption for one minute in that meeting, right? Uh, because it's the uh, sanctions that the Russians care about. But technically, you can play games that way and say, "Well, we were talking about adopt." Well, baloney. Uh, we know it's about sanctions, lifting the sanctions in return for throwing the election in favor of Donald Trump. It's a quid pro quo deal, and they're trying to figure out how to do the deal. So uh, uh, Putin's fingerprints aren't too close to it, and Trump certainly aren't too close to it. And well, I, I think that's what was going on there. His DNA is all over it. That's his son taking that meeting. Oh, yeah, big so. time. Hey, do you know Walter Sh- uh, Schaub, Jr.? Oh, yes. He's a great man. I, he was the uh, one of the top lawyers of the Office of Government Ethics when I was in the Bush White House, and he helped us get a lot of the uh, ethics work done for our nominees and he was since then uh, appointed by President Obama to be the head of the Office of Government Ethics. Uh, he's a really solid guy, did a great job there at OGE, but he got into a spat with the Trump administration because the uh, Trump uh, White House doesn't want to follow the ethics rules and basically wrote him a letter saying the ethics rules don't apply to the White House staff. And then uh, he told President Trump that he ought to divest himself of his uh, assets to create conflicts of interest. That's right. Uh, he was told to pound sand over that. So he finally got fed up with his nonsense and quit. Uh, but he, he left only uh, six months early. His term would have expired anyway, and uh, President Trump would not have uh, renominated him. Well, I think uh, his he, resignation was a was a very, very good uh, uh, statement. I think it was a strong statement, and I think uh, he resigned. For those of you who don't know, uh, Walter Schaub uh, resigned. He is the top ethics watchdog in the White House, okay? Uh, he works in the Office of Government Ethics. Didn't you work there, too? Yeah. Uh, no, I, wor- I was the lawyer, the chief White House law, uh, to the lawyer president. in the White House. The Office of Government Ethics is down, actually down the street uh, and supervises the entire executive branch uh, ethics operations. It does not report to the White House. Uh, obviously, the president is in charge of the executive branch, so ultimately does a report to the president. But it's an independent uh, agency in that the uh, director is supposed to have a five-year term that goes into the next presidential term um, and should not be removed except for for cause, uh, we were always worried about where Donald Trump would try to remove Walter Schaub, um, uh, but he, he did not. Um, but Walter Schaub's term was going to expire, and I, I think he was absolutely right to uh, to point out. And he told this to the New York Times. Apparently, I read it in today's paper that yeah, me you know too. this this approach is making us the laughing stock. That's it uh, of the of the world uh, with respect to ethics and. I just want to add to that. I think there's a lot of laughing going on in the Kremlin right now. Yeah, I do, too. We really look bad. Oh, well, listen, uh, every one of the intelligence heads that have testified said the same thing as you. uh, Russia is laughing right now. They're chortling right now. They're hysterical laughing right now. And Walter Schaub, who uh, headed up the Office of Government Ethics, he said, I think we are pretty close to a laughing stock at this point. He said it's hard for the United States to pursue international anti-corruption and ethics initiatives when we're not even keeping our own side of the street clean. Well, that's certainly a problem. I mean, we we stuck to a new low here, and it's not just about the Russia business. It's about conflicts of interest here in the United States with respect to the president's investments, the Kushner family, uh, the obstruction of justice problem that we have with the firing of James Comey from the FBI. And Preet uh, Bahara. Uh, now we're finding out Preet yeah. Bahara was uh, prosecuting the Prevazon case, which Natalia and uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Ahmed Menchin uh, was also, uh, you know, they were also counsel on that case. So, I mean, this circle is very tight. It's very small. Yeah, uh, but I, I think we're going to get to the bottom of what's going on. Congress is going to have an increasing amount of pressure to, to investigate. If the members of Congress don't do their job, I, I think they're going to get voted out. Uh, the president's approval ratings are going in the tank. Yeah, uh, I saw them today. Yeah, it's not a good situation for anybody right now, particularly for the Republicans, because they're going to have to... Um, uh, they're going to have to uh, take ownership of this situation or stand up to the president. 
And I, I remember when Donald Trump won the nomination, a lot of Republicans saying, well, uh, uh, the worst thing that could happen to our party would be if he won. <laughs> yes. I, I, I remember. I remember the Never Trumpers. I remember even Elliot Cohn and I started to agree. It, it, it's a very bizarre world right now. Uh, you know, this, this makes for strange bedfellows, but I'm so glad that you will, uh, you know, climb in with me every once in a while. <laughs> Oh, we're going to have to keep them, uh, we're going to have to keep a lot of fire out of them and keep our eye on it because uh, uh, this is getting worse. Uh, and it's going to probably get worse before it gets better. Mm. I am not convinced that this president uh, wants to conduct his, uh, uh, himself in this office uh, in accordance with the Constitution, what he's required to do under law. And we, we do not elect a king in this country. Uh, we don't have a royal family. That's another problem. All the nepotism is going on. And, uh, we um, we have a president who has to serve under the terms set forth of the Constitution and the rest of our laws, and that's not what's going on right now. What did you, uh, th- just as a last uh, little thought, it just popped into my head, uh, it, it's never going to happen, but I know that there were some Democrats in the House who wanted to introduce a bill based on the 25th Amendment where they were going to have a commission to judge presidential fitness. Has the time come for that, or is it ridiculous? Well, I am ser- I am concerned about the president's uh, uh, psychological state from time to time when he tweets and he gets angry. Uh, and the, the concern is that is this situation deteriorates with respect to the Russia investigation, whether he's going to lose his cool and can lose his cool in a uh, situation involving North Korea or something oh, else. Oh, yeah. Uh, where, there, you know, he's got control of the nukes there and, the 25th Amendment is designed to allow the cabinet, the vice president, right. to either temporarily or with the consent of Congress permanently remove the president from from his uh, his duties for, for reasons really related to the president's physical or mental health. Uh, uh, but I, I think we should be willing to give that serious consideration, at least at a temporary wow. basis, <clears throat> if a president isn't able to... to handle things. And it wouldn't necessarily just be Trump. You could have a situation where... There's just too much stress, and uh, you get the you know the nuclear power, nuclear weapons, and everything, and you have something like a Cuban Missile Crisis. I mean, not every president is up to handling something like that, and <laughs> and you, you know if you if you don't uh, sideline them, say take a vacation, you know. Oh my God! Uh, well, let's just put hope the vice president in there. You could blow it all up. I let's mean, just hope very... he suffers from nothing but Twitter Tourettes because yeah, we yeah. would hope. <laughs> but I don't think the 25th Amendment ought to be dismissed out of hand. We ought to also really? remember it can, be, so, can be temporary. You can temporarily remove and say the president's going to step aside for a month or two while we figure it out and see whether he's ready to go forward. So, it's, counsel, let me ask you a question. Um, uh, when you say 25th Amendment, cabinet, and consent of Congress, do you need both, or can one or the other? Well, you temporarily, uh, with the vice president, the majority of the cabinet, uh, and that's the, the temporary measure. And I think that's what's most important, because you could have a, a, a very um, uh, tense situation, uh, maybe North Korea or something like that. And it's just very clear the president is not of a mental uh, capacity to handle that situation at that mm-hmm. moment. I, I think the 25th Amendment uh, steps are justified on a temporary basis to, to permit both the president or to, for a prolonged period, remove the president. Uh, Congress is going to need to be involved, and there does, under the Constitution, have to be a vote of both houses. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I think that all the different options under the 25th Amendment will have to be taken seriously. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> and looked at. That doesn't mean we use them. Right, right, but right. We need to be taking them seriously. And the cabinet members need to know that's part of their obligation uh, for the public safety. I'm frightened now. Thank you. No, <laughs> I agree with you. I, I understand. I just wanted to know uh, whether or not you thought the 25th Amendment was something that we ought to actually, uh, you know, pay attention to and, and, and explore at the very least. And I guess your answer is yes. So, like I said. Well, yeah, I think we ought to explore it and know what it's about. And uh, no, we have to use it. It's there. Well, let's, cabinet like I said, let's just it. hope that he unwinds by tweeting and not unravels by bombing, because, I mean, yeah. I, I could see it. I really can. Well, listen, I, I, I am so grateful that you take the time for us. Uh, congratulations on the, uh, you know, exp- the the logs uh, at Mar-a-Lago. Hopefully the White House is next. I, I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, keep up the good work and stay in touch with us uh, as much as you can. Thank you. Thanks. Great. 
Bye-bye. Bye. <laughs> I love him. He sounds exactly the way you'd want him to sound. He sounds like a Bush ethics advisor as far as, well, I, th- I just love him. And he doesn't mince words. And, uh, you know, he is, he is a professor of corporate law. Okay? He teaches corporate law, which includes ethics. He's also been the counselor to W. His ethics advisor. So I think he knows a little bit about what he's talking about. But the scary part is everybody's just saying, my God, this guy wakes up angry. And what if something happens? And, uh, you know, it's not just Twitter Tourette's, but it's global Tourette's. And, you know, he starts, uh, you know, screaming. He wants to take out this or that. He gets so angry. 25th Amendment, anybody? Go to RandyRhodes.com for the whole thing and a podcast. Buy a stinking podcast.